Welcome to Gateway Church Baptism Weekend. As you can hear, the buzz out here is super exciting. If you're in person or online, we're so happy that you're with us today. Uh, said it's Baptism Weekend, and so we're going to do this after service. And so if you came to the service today and you didn't bring clothes to change it, you have all that you need. Just find someone in the lobby, and they'll help you out. Behind me, I've got Grady and Becca. They're going to get baptized to get t- together, and so they felt on their heart to get baptized this weekend, and they're going to do it together as mother and son. So let's celebrate with them as they get baptized today. It's a super exciting weekend out here. We've got a we got party, we've got a grill, we've got po- lo- lollipops, all the things you might need. So come on out after service and join us. And we're going to continue the excitement into worship as we worship together today.
We celebrate that we can know you intimately, that you are not a far off, distant God, but that you are here, that we can have relationship with you, that your spirit is in this place. Lord, you are welcome here. sounds so beautiful when we sing together. 
when our voices are connected. And I want to encourage you, we're, we're not just singing words or melodies that sound good or that make us feel emotionally charged. We're actually inviting the presence of the Holy Spirit into our lives. And I want you to resist the temptation to just sing songs. We are here to worship the living God, the King of the universe, to welcome His very presence, the God who created everything that exists is here to know you. Can we take just a moment, if you're comfortable to, if you want to lift your hands, let's just close our eyes and let's just let the significance of the moment sink in, that He is here. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. You come and do whatever you want. This is your church. I am your person. I belong to you. Welcome in my life. Welcome. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come on, sing. Flood this place and fill the atmosphere. So we'll run to the fire. 
first breath and running into your arms is running to life from death and I feel
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! I love that song so much. That song for me orients my perspective to just how big God is. And I don't know if you're like me at all, but what I end up doing sometimes is allowing circumstances, allowing problems, my life in general, sometimes even people to eclipse who God is, to eclipse the magnitude of who God is in my life. And my wife and I went to a freedom retreat about three years ago, and there was a one-liner in that retreat that I've stuck to and gone back to because for me, it's been very centering, and that is the anecdote to despair is the magnanimity of God. The anecdote for despair is the magnanimity of God. Said differently, the cure for sadness, the cure for anxiety, the cure for hopelessness or for despair is understanding just how big God is for you. Amen? Just how big He is for you. And not just that He's bigger than sickness and hopelessness, which He is, but He's so big and expansive that we can all fit and hide and abide and live, move, have our being in who He is for us. Amen? Psalms 95 says this, for the Lord says, in His hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are also in His hands. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Sometimes I need scripture to help broaden my perspective on who God is. And I want to invite you, I don't know what you're dealing with or what you brought to service today, but maybe you're faced with hopelessness. Maybe you're faced with a trial that maybe seems daunting. And right now as I pray, I want to invite you to turn, look to the Lord and have him show you just how big he is for you. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the reality of who you are and that that reality trumps our natural reality. I thank you, God, that you are bigger than what we're facing and that we can hide and we can abide and we can live a life fully in you. I pray that you help us to change our perspective and help us to see who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, as I mentioned, we have baptisms this weekend, so if you have not been baptized and you want to get baptized, we have clothes, all that you need, so just go out to the lobby, find someone wearing a made new t-shirt, and we'd be happy to help you get all that set up for you. But before you take your seat, say hi to those around you. Welcome again to Gateway Church. Whether you're at a gathering, a campus, or online, we're so glad you're joining us. A lot of great things are happening at Gateway. Here are just a few. To stay connected with all that's going on, visit gatewaypeople.com, follow us on social media, and join your campus Facebook group. If you'd like to give today, you can do that through our website, our mobile app, or one of the offering envelopes at any of our campuses. There are so many opportunities to grow, connect, and to be encouraged. To learn more, stop by Connect Central, text CONNECT to 71010, or visit gatewaypeople.com. We're so glad you've joined us. Thanks for being here today.
Heaven holds its breath, waiting in anticipation as an inner transformation becomes a public declaration. I once was lost, wounded, lonely, afraid. I was dead in my sin. Not a washing of the body, but a cleansing of the spirit, a resurrection of beauty from the ashes, a celebration of faith. Now I'm found. Healed. Loved. Brave. Now I am alive in Christ. Made new. Made new. Made new. Made new. New. Jesus is this warrior king, and when he returns, he will set things right. You are still not supposed to go wage a war unless God has told you to do it. He is also the person who is willing to put the sword back in the sheath and lay down his life. How we decide to use the power that Christ has given us will be our testimony, and it will be our inheritance. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Gateway Church. Thanks so much for being here. We are honored to worship with you today. I want to welcome all the campuses, everyone watching online, everyone at a gathering, and everyone watching from a prison campus. We are so honored that you are joining us in worshiping today. And uh, I, I, I guess what I need to start with is, uh, you know what I'm going to start with, the whole Josh thing, all right? <laughs> you, I'll, I'm going to admit, you guys found some old Joshes. If you haven't been here for the past couple weeks, um, we, we've been having a feud a little bit because I said there's no old Joshes in the world. Uh, you, found, you found one, it was Josh McDowell, but you were wrong terribly. His name's not even Josh. So uh, you conceded defeat. I saw all of you concede uh, last week. You conceded defeat. Uh, but you, I've, I've been flooded <laughs> with old Josh uh, um, emails and messages on social media. And uh, I will admit, though, most of them are dead. And uh, so they did live to be old, but they're dead now. So it wasn't that encouraging, honestly. But thank you for sending them anyways. Uh, so I pulled the actual statistics just so you can, and can get a, a feeling for this. In 1945, only 97 people, men, were named Joshua, all right? In 1945, 97. In 1982, the year I was born... 38,000. <laughs> in 1985, it reached its peak of 42,000. And I'll tell you this, from 1984 to 1994, for 10 consecutive years, it maintained its spot as the number four most popular name for men in America. So there you go. There's a lot of Joshes out there now. And we're going to be getting old pretty soon. We are, we're kind of already there. I want to remind you that uh, Pastor Robert will be back next weekend. He's going to start a great series called Dream to Destiny, so we're looking forward to that. That's going to be a great time for us to be able to get together. And then I want to give you an update. Something I mentioned on the very first week whenever we talked is that uh, the, the book that I read that really inspired me to preach this series, I'm not preaching through the book necessarily. I'm not saying that everything I say is what the author of the book would say uh, I'm not trying to speak for him. What his work did was influence me greatly, and it has, uh, it has influenced this. So what, what I encourage you to do was to go out and get the book. A lot of people did, and we haven't had any since then. The publisher's been scrambling to get them. I think there are still some on Amazon, and they may be back here this weekend at some of the campuses. But the book is called Who Ate Lunch with Abraham by Asher and Trader. And I just want to encourage you to get that book. Um, because he goes into so much more detail than we've been able to go to in this series. So I'm going to continue the series. The title of the message today is called The Story. And this is what I've been, if you've been following along the series, you know this is what I've been waiting to share with you. Um, I don't know if you'll like it or not, but what happened to me is I got done with the first chapter of Who Ate Lunch with Abraham, and I set the book down, and as if... Uh, 
a million files in my brain all came together. I saw one complete story that had looked like fragments up until then, and then it was one entire story. So I don't have any, I don't have any scriptures for today, although all of this is scripture. I'm telling you the story of scripture. I don't have any points for us today. I just wanna tell you the story, and we're gonna go through the story, and, and, and it just was amazing to me the way that so many things came together whenever I, I read through this book, started praying through this, and things just sort of uh, fell in, into place within this story. The grand story of all of this came together, and that's the story that I want to tell you today. Jesus is the king. He is the king of the universe. He's the king over our realm. He's the king over this earth. He's the king over this physical realm and the spiritual realm. There's no question about that. Yet there is an enemy, there is someone who is fighting against the forces of good, fighting for the forces of evil, and we, we believe and know that God can do all things, that he can, he can speak a word and cause creation to come into existence, but there are heavenly laws or spiritual laws or realms that exist that are honored within the spiritual realm, and a battle is taking place over the earth, a battle to take dominion over the earth is taking place, and we are a part of that. Jesus is the king over the earth. He created the world through the power of the Father, and everything that was created was created through him and for him. That's who Jesus is. He, he, he designed every single thing that we see and everything that we don't see. And this is important because everything that we actually know about the Father only comes through Jesus. We've been pointing to all, a myriad of passages that say that no one has ever seen the Father or heard the Father's voice, obviously, or, or seen God. And obviously, that's not what it's necessarily saying is that we've never seen God. We know that Jesus is God and people have seen Jesus. We, Jesus spoke to people. It's really that no one has ever seen God the Father except as being revealed through Jesus. So even in the times where we hear, hear the Father's voice, in, there's an instance in, in Matthew and in Mark and a couple different places where the Father says things like, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Every time the Father speaks, the Son is present. He is what makes the Father's word known to us. This is what the Bible describes as, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. This is Jesus. Everything that we know about the Father is revealed to us through Jesus and Jesus alone. This should, this should blow our minds, actually, because if we just think about Jesus creating the world, Jesus uh, becoming his own creation, coming down to the world and being crucified for us, rising again in all of his power, all of the miracles that he did here on earth, all of the ways that Jesus has worked, and he made himself in a form that we were able actually to see and to interact with. But God the Father, if you were to get a glimpse of him, you would be obliterated because his glory is so powerful, his, 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 his nature is so pure, and ours is so corrupt. God is so much bigger and, and more vast than, than we realize in any way at all. He's so much bigger. We, we like to think that we know everything about God. We like to think that we know everything about our belief or our, our, our belief in Christ or our religion or anything like that. And, and we like to have all the answers to everybody's questions so that we can prove that Christianity is real and right. And, and, and I'll tell you in a moment why that doesn't work, but, but, but God is so big and there's so much that we don't know or understand about him. And yet we have this glimpse of him that we have seen through Jesus. Jesus has been around since the beginning. He has always been with us. And so we don't understand as much as we think we do. And so there was an angel a son of God, as some translations call him, that rebelled and was thrown out of the kingdom and thrown down into the earth. That is what is called the beast, or you may call him Satan or the devil. The beast was thrown down into the earth. And so this happened before, before uh, you know, obviously the beast is the one that tempts Adam and Eve. So at some point in that time frame, the beast is thrust down into the earth. I believe that we as human beings were created, mankind was created 
to destroy through our dominion over the earth to destroy the beast. So the beast, Satan, was expelled out of the kingdom and sent down into the earth. And the beast was then losing power because no one was worshiping him. He was, had been expelled from the kingdom. And so he wants to establish his reign over the earth. We talked a little bit last week about a reimagining of the story of the prodigal son, but think for just a moment about the story of the prodigal son, about a, a, a son of God that, was, that chose to leave the kingdom, then lived in, in, in absolute, abject, uh, destitute, terrible conditions, off an awful, awful place, and he lived in that, but he decided to go back to his kingdom. If for a moment, we think that God's grace and forgiveness wouldn't extend even to someone such as the beast if he were to confess, we don't know or understand God's grace. The story of the prodigal son could easily be the story of the beast returning back to the Lord, but he chooses not to. He chooses to want to be worshiped and to want to be God himself. And this is what his whole, uh, his whole idea is, is that we would worship him, and in doing so, we would give him power. And so then his way of, of doing this, of, of trying to take over the dominion that we have over the earth, is either to tempt us or to kill us. Now, he can't physically kill us. Satan, the beast, cannot actually physically kill us because we have dominion over the earth. How would he do it then? He comes along and he whispers in someone else's ear to get them to do it for him. He can't actually take away the calling that God has on your life. Instead, he can come along and he can whisper into your ear and he can tempt you to throw it all away for yourself. But you are the one who has dominion. All he has is a, a level of authority that was handed over to him. Our dominion is ours. It is given to us. It is engraved in our very DNA. We are made in his image. And in that image, encoded within our very body, is the dominion of the earth. And so as we talked about last week, in the fall of man, we didn't lose our dominion over earth. We lost our authority. Uh, all right. Let's just pause there for a moment. I'm gonna go ahead in the story just for a brief moment. Jesus uh, is crucified. He goes down, he defeats hell. He comes back up and he's gonna, re he's gonna rise back up into the heavenly realm. And what does he say? I have given you all authority. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Authority is what Jesus won back for us in his death and resurrection. And so those levels of authority are laws within the spiritual realm and they are truths that cannot be violated or broken. And so the king, Jesus, has in essence been expelled out of the lives of Adam and Eve because what they said is, we'd rather be God for ourselves. We'd rather choose what is right and wrong for ourselves. And so therefore then, uh, we as humans expel the king out of our lives and say, we don't wanna live by your rules. We don't wanna live in your kingdom. We want to establish our own kingdom. And so he comes along to Adam and Eve, the beast, and he tempts them in exactly the same way that he was tempted himself. The beast wanted to not serve in God's kingdom anymore and pass on the worship to him. He wanted to decide for himself what was right and wrong. He wanted to receive and take all of that worship for himself. And so that's the plan that he knows, and that's the way that he goes and tempts Adam and Eve. You can be like God. You can decide right from wrong. And when mankind falls for this, it expels the one true king from being the king in our lives. We can only have one king in our lives. And so Jesus says that through the seed of this woman, Eve, through the seed of this woman will come a man that will crush the beast's head. So out of the seed, and this is really important because the, the Bible clearly states that it will be out of the seed of this woman that a man will rise up and crush the head of the beast. Adam and Eve then have Cain and Abel, and the beast is fearful about who will rise up and destroy him. You might remember that Abel was serving the old king. He was serving the king faithfully and doing what was asked of him. He was abiding by the rules of the old kingdom, abiding by the rules of the king. And so uh, Satan, the, the beast, he cannot 
take out Abel himself. So what does he do? He comes along to Cain and he tempts him to kill him. What is he attempting to do? Not just to wreak havoc, not just to cause problems in the world, but to destroy the seed of the woman so that he doesn't get destroyed himself. This theme will run all through the the rest of what we're gonna talk about. So remember that. He he has two ways, again, of dealing with us. And uh, the, the, the only two ways that he has is to tempt or to tempt people to kill. And so Abel serves the one true king, finds favor, and this is the way that the beast removes him in an effort to maintain his uh, authority in the earth. The beast is tirelessly working to take the kingdom of earth as his own. And so he sets in these fallen sons of God over different territories that are called principalities. These principalities are regions of the earth where different fallen angels, fallen sons of God, uh, rule over those different areas and, and, and cause as much chaos and destruction as they can. I don't know exactly what happened pre-flood, but we know that because we see it in scripture, we know that even pre-flood, some of these fallen sons of God took human wives and, 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 and those, those, the, the offspring of those people were part of what was causing so much trouble. And it, it, the Bible even talks of these giants that made the Israelites look like grasshoppers. Again, there's so much we don't know about the actual spiritual warfare that is taking place. We only see what we see in front of us. It is a loss of vision, but there's so much more taking place. These giants are actually mentioned three times more in the Bible than Mary, the mother of Jesus. Something was happening, and I believe that the flood had something to do with it. I believe that the flood was a way for God to, uh, to the king to exterminate these forces of evil that were taking over. And so what does he do? He takes a man like Noah. He begins a new covenant with him, much like he had with Adam and Eve. And he goes to Noah, and he goes, hey, I want you to build a boat. And everybody in the world was like, you can ignore that crazy guy. He's just over there building a boat. We haven't seen rain in forever. You don't have to pay any attention to that. That's the brilliance of the way the king works is he does it in ways that the enemy will not know or recognize. And he always uses people that the enemy would not expect. And so here he comes along to Noah and he tells him to build a boat. And the flood then cleanses in some way. And after that, he continues to to make these covenants with different men and women on earth that he can partner with to help pull himself back into his kingdom and take his rightful place as our king. This is a story of a king who loves his people so much that even when they reject him and they push him out, he will do whatever it takes to break back into their lives and to be a part of their lives again. And so he does this through these spiritual covenants. And we know that we are not at war with flesh and blood, that this is a spiritual war. And so he continues to preserve the line of Adam and Eve. This is, this is what happens even in the flood. He's continuing to preserve the line of Adam and Eve, the seed of Eve, by causing the Israelites to grow into a powerful nation. Abraham and Sarah are hit with extreme temptation, and the strategies of the beast have not changed. It's either to tempt them or to try to kill them. And so God keeps making these covenants and he keeps trying to preserve this line. And the the beast tempts a man named Pharaoh to enslave the Israelites. And the Pharaoh is even concerned with the growing numbers of the Israelites because God is causing them to grow in number and in power. And so the king partners with a man named Moses who was preserved even through the, what the beast had planned and even through the beast tempting Pharaoh to kill every young male that was born, the king preserves Moses. And so the beast knew that a man would still rise up out of that line of Eve to defeat him. And so he does everything he can to enslave and kill the Israelites. But the king hides Moses. Where does he hide him? In Pharaoh's own castle. In all of his brilliance, he continues to work to make a covenant with mankind so that we can conquer the enemy, the beast that so easily ensnares us. And so the king frees the Israelites and takes them on a journey to a land that he has reserved for them. You could say it sort of like this. He was preparing a place for them. 
But to get there, they would have to go through the wilderness. And the wilderness is the place where we are strengthened for battle. And it is also the place where trials cause us to question the goodness of the king. And only obedience to the king and covenant faithfulness will allow us to escape. Questioning the will of God and his love for us is the oldest and most used tactic by the beast. You still hear it today, I hear it all the time, and it's a question that I've had a lot of difficulty answering in the past when people say, why would a loving God allow such terrible things to happen to us here on earth? Why would that take place? Who, what kind of God would do that? This is the original thing that happened with the, the, the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When I thought, I, I, I was reading through this book and I, I went back to this question, uh, why would a loving God let all of this happen? I started to reconcile in my mind that Jesus as the king was fighting a war. And when we see some of the violence in the Old Testament that takes place, this is a king desperately fighting a war to make it back to his people so that he can reign over them once again. And then I thought about it and I started thinking, what an arrogant question. What kind of loving God would cause all these bad things to happen? Wait a second. I'm not in charge of deciding what is good and bad. That's me living out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm called to serve God. I'm called to serve the king. I'm called to obey him no matter what he asks me to do. What arrogance would I have to have to say, God, what, are, what makes you so good that you would let bad things happen because I've decided for myself what is good and bad? This is the oldest temptation and the one that will continue to plague the world. It is the one that we must be able to answer. It is, it is a, a, a thing that, that a lie that, that, that mankind believed. It continues to be this strong temptation today. And so let's remember that we are not to decide what is good or bad. I, I spoke last week about our, our, our mission as Christians is not to go and fight whatever culture wars are most frustrating us. We will do that. We will be a beacon of light. We will stand for morality. We will stand up and fight for morality. We will do that, but only when the commander of the Lord's army tells us which battles to fight. We're called to stand as an example. That was his entire goal for the Israelites is that they would be a light on a hill, that people would see them and that they would stand out as an example. Jesus didn't walk around going, uh, I, know, I know what you did. I mean, he has knowledge of what every single person has done. He didn't walk around and just shame them and go, I know what you've done. Oh, I know the bad thing you've done. I, I know what you've done. Instead, he was ministering love to them. I, 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 I genuinely, uh, you, mm, let me think about how to say this. I sometimes feel a responsibility to stand here and challenge us and not the world. Because we could stand here and say, oh, what they're doing is wrong. This is so wrong. This is so bad. Look at what they're doing. And we would all cheer and we'd feel really good about ourselves that we're not doing some of those things. And that would be great. It might feel medicating for that moment, but that's not what we're, that's not our goal in this time. Our goal is to continue to work towards bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. And in order to do that, we will need to be able to evaluate ourselves and not sit here and go, the whole world is against us, everything is wrong, we will need to be able to see what our actions are doing in the world and, and, and we'll need to be able to take responsibility for them. So the king goes to war on our behalf and he guides the Israelites when they go into battle. He protects them no matter how many times they break the covenant with him. The Israelites eventually make it to the land that God has preserved for them, a land that he redeemed and set apart for his people, a land that is supposed to be that beacon of light to the surrounding darkness. And the Israelites have been growing in number and strength, but the forces of evil rise up to stop this invasion from the king. And many tribes and nations of the beast will fight the people of the king, but his strength is too much for them. He causes them to be a mighty and powerful nation. And when darkness rises against them, he fights for them and protects them. Each man of covenant 
or woman of covenant faithfulness is tested through extreme temptation. And many times their lives are threatened by the beast over and over. Sarah is a woman of covenant faithfulness, just like Abraham, yet she is tempted with the lie of the beast. Don't believe that the king really does want good things for you and will give you offspring. Don't believe that. That is the same lie that the enemy always tells. Joseph is a man of covenant faithfulness. And while the beast couldn't tempt him, he tried to kill him. So he caused a seed of jealousy to rise up in his brothers. And in his fear that Joseph may be the one to crush him, he does everything he can to end the life of Joseph. David is one of those men of covenant faithfulness who was indeed a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And the beast continues in his path to destroy the seed of the woman. And he tempts David with sexual sin. And David gives into the temptation. This is the same plot of the enemy over and over and over again. And it is the same faithful, patient, loving king who continues to go, I'll trust you. I'll partner with you. Together we can do this. You are co, co, uh, co-authors, co, co-dominion uh, people of this world. I've given you this dominion over the earth for us to do something with it. And so over and over, the men and women who rise up as forces for good and war against the beasts are plagued with overwhelming temptation or death. One day there was an earthly king named Herod, and while he was in command as an earthly king but still serving the beast, Satan, A group of wise men came looking for the Messiah, the one who would save the world and set things right and become the new king. The beast works in the way that he always has, in the way that he did even with Pharaoh and Moses, and he causes Herod to issue a decree to kill all of the young males once again so that he can destroy the seed of Eve that will one day rise up to kill him. Yet this is no ordinary man. He is the son of God, Yeshua, Jesus, This is the one that is born into the world, the man that will fulfill all of the covenants that have been made before. And the beast fails in his attempt to kill him as a child. And the whole spiritual realm is thrown into war and chaos. Is he really the son of God? Is he really the one that will crush Satan? Is he here to issue a final judgment on the beast? Will he be successful in overthrowing the authority that the beast has over the world? Or will he fail like so many before him? And if this man really is the king, shouldn't he be gathering an army and preparing for battle? Instead, he chooses 12 men and several women who will be in his inner circle. And these men are largely uneducated and seemingly in no way a threat to the kingdom of darkness. The king is even rejected by many who had followed him faithfully before. And yet the beast has only two options in the war, to either tempt the man or kill the man. So when Jesus is at his weakest After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, what does he do? He shows up to tempt him. What does he tempt him with? The authority. I'll give you the kingdoms of the earth because he has authority over them. Jesus doesn't fall into temptation, so he says, well, fine then. What I'll do is I'll just kill this man. And so he causes a seed of jealousy yet again to rise up in his brothers and they make a plan or a plot to kill him. And what he doesn't know or understand is that because a covenant has been made and because Jesus has never sinned and he has never broken that covenant, that in his death, he fulfills that covenant and removes the enemy's authority. This is, the, this is the way that he breaks that curse that took place in the fall. And so then he gives us back that authority. And just when the beast thinks that he has won because he has killed the king himself, the king himself actually shows up in the depths of hell. He's supposed to be there to atone for his sins and suffer under the rule of the beast. But the rules of the spiritual kingdom say that he will, the rules of the spiritual kingdom say that he will suffer death and hell only if he himself has committed those sins, not if he bore the consequences for someone else. And so the beast has been tricked. He's been defeated. The king defeats the beast through his suffering for his people. He defeats the beast through the love that he has for this creation and all of us, so much so that he would lay down his life for the ones that he loved. Yet the king does not issue his final judgment on the beast. Instead, he gives us what we had lost, which is our authority. And he says, you want to be my partner again? 
You want to give this one more try? Will you recognize the dominion and the authority that's been given to you? Will you step into the calling that the king has ordained for your life? He could have just issued a final judgment on the beast right there. He has defeated him. And yet he says once again, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. It might feel like the wilderness for a little while, but we've got work to do. The wilderness will prepare you for battle. And you, mankind, were designed and destined to destroy the beast. So, when will the beast get his final judgment and be destroyed? Three things are needed for the return of the king and for the beast to be finally defeated. The bride must be ready, the nations must hear the gospel, and the Jewish people must see Jesus as the Messiah. Now, uh, quick note here. Um, Don't just walk up to Jewish people and be like, you need to see Jesus as the Messiah. It's not a good idea. All right? I'm telling you that this is what needs to take place. Um, but uh, that's not going to be the way that we're going to go about it, all right? Get involved in the Jewish ministry if you want to find out how we're doing that. I don't have time to talk about it. All right, so what is the beast's plan then to make sure he gets to continue living on earth? Same plan it's always been. Tempt you or kill you. Tempt you to follow other gods. Tempt you to, to, to disobey the king. Tempt you to... to, to squander your inheritance, to squander your authority. And this is why there has been an outrageous amount of animosity towards Jewish people, because if the beast can exterminate the Jewish people, he can avoid his final judgment. And this is why the temptation on you is so great as well. Because you're the workers in his kingdom. You're the one with dominion. You're the one with authority. You're the one that he has chosen to partner with. And so if the bees can exterminate the Jewish people, just like he tried so many times to destroy the seed of Eve, then he can stop us in our tracks from destroying him. There's a new religion that's popping up everywhere. It's the one of rationalism. One where people claim to have no ideologies, yet they are riddled with them. Ideologies that are so strong that there are even punishments for doing it wrong, saying the wrong thing. A religion that has popped up that will punish you if you speak against it. A religion that has popped up that says, We're, we don't need myth or legend or story. We're purely scientific while still ignoring the science of simple things like biology. Okay, that was a shot at the world. I'm sorry. I said I wasn't going to do that. (laughs) We could have just one. We could have just one. This religion is taking over. The new religion, religion claims to be purely scientific, and it has moved past and decided that it is better than all of its ancestors. And part of the reason why I wanted to do this is so that we would rediscover the faith of our ancestors. The Jewish scriptures, what we might could try to call the Old Testament. It's fine to say that, the Old Testament, the New Testament. It is one story. It is one story of one king breaking in and trying to interact with his people and us learning to live under the king's rule. And this new religion says that they have ignored everything that our ancestors have brought to us. In the future, the algorithm will be the new God. I genuinely believe this. Already, um, somehow my phone knows that I, I, I don't have a beach towel and wanted one. And it told me which beach towel to buy. I did it. I obeyed it. I just ordered it right then. The, be- the, the, the algorithm will tell you how to get to places. The algorithm will, will know everything ab- about you and it will deliver everything to you and you will hope that the algorithm is kind to you and brings you good fortune and some will even pray to it. 
Oh, I hope the algorithm gives me long life, long life, health, wealth, and prosperity. I hope the algorithm has decided that I have a good enough social status to get this job or that job. I hope the algorithm has decided one day medicines will show up to your door that you didn't even know you needed, but the algorithm decided for you that you needed it. And you can see how quickly and how tempting that would be to then start saying, I hope the algorithm does well for me. I I do this. I I use, whenever I'm navigating somewhere, I use Waze. And I'm like, don't do me wrong, Waze. You better send me on the right path, all right? I know that they split people up. Like if there's a wreck, they go, we'll send some people the fast way. We'll send a few people this way. So that way I'll stay fast. I know it. So I'm like, Waze, give me the right way. Come on. (laughs) We tend to deify that that we don't understand. Because we deify that that we don't understand, we will soon deify, many people across the world will deify the algorithm. They won't know why they got a certain job. They won't know parameter, what parameters it calculated. They won't know how it decided what their fate would be. And so they'll listen to that. They'll deify what they don't understand. And there's an important lesson in that. We as Christians need to stop acting like we understand God. You cannot deify something that you know because if God can fit in our human brains, he's not that great after all. We need to be okay with a little bit of mystery. We need to be okay with a little bit of not understanding why God does what he does when he does it. We need to be okay with saying, I don't understand. We need to be okay, even in times of apologetics or talking to people, witnessing about Christ, when they ask us a question, we need to be able to say, that, my friend, is a mystery, and that's why God is so great. I may not understand it, but I know that he has a plan, and I trust in it, and I believe in it. So today we see the king, and his name is Jesus. He's still breaking into our realm and still preserving his people. He's faithful to his covenant, even when we aren't. And for some reason, he still chooses to partner with us. And this faithful remnant in a desperate world is standing as a light on the hill to the nations. And when all hope is lost, we remember that not even death could defeat our king. And he has rescued us from the beast. We remember that it is us who have dominion over this earth and we will be part of the generation that stewards this creation well and ushers in the kingdom of heaven. And you are part of his plan. So this uh, couple months or weeks ago, I guess, a uh, couple weeks ago, I guess, uh, we decided to take a vacation. Some friends of ours invited us to a place in uh, Cabo. And so we went and we stayed there. And for a couple of days, it was uh, like um, just a little resort place, you know. And so I had the swimming pools and the beach right there. And the weather was perfect. And one day I was sitting in a lounge chair and I was, I was just sitting there by the pool. And this guy walked by and uh, he was... He, he was ripped, you know, and uh, he was walking into like the VIP section, you know, the part I couldn't get into. And, and he, was, he was walking and he had so much confidence even in the way that he was walking. And this thought just occurred to me. I thought, I wish I was, I wish I was him. I wish I was there. Enjoying this great resort, being all confident and all this stuff, you know. And, and, and for some reason, I found myself imagining what his life is like and how great it is and all of this stuff. And then I got quiet for a second. It was like a, a thought just came into my mind. And here I was going, I'm so jealous of this guy. Look at this resort that he's at. And I go, well, I'm here. I'm right here. Why do I do this so often? And what I've been learning lately is that a lot of times I'm physically here, but I'm not present. I'm physically in a place, but I'm somewhere else. 
And I, I think actually, when I think about it, I think I'm living most of my life that way oftentimes. Where I'm ra- rarely ever actually there in that moment, realizing where I am and who I am. So I, I, want, I want you to forgive me and just try this for a second, okay? We're just gonna, we're gonna do something a little bit different If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, I'm gonna pray in just a moment, but I want us actually to just locate ourselves for just a second. I want you to imagine that you are staring at the world from a very zoomed out view, a Google Earth type of view. And you see the world You see it's round shape, you're very zoomed out. I want you to get that picture in your mind. God can hold the world, that that world that you're looking at right now in the palm of his hand. Imagine like a cue ball from a pool table. That's how God can hold it in his hand. In fact, if you were to shrink the earth down to that level, it would feel as smooth as a cue ball. And so now in order to see the ridges and the topography, we need to start zooming in. So I want you to imagine where you are in the earth. Picture just as it does, zooming in more and more and more. And now pull yourself to right where you are right now sitting in your seat. There's people all around you. You're sitting in your seat. I want you to feel the weight of your body in your seat. Your feet on the ground. Here you are. Now imagine that right there, wherever you're sitting, All the people around you are gone. And now you're sitting in that seat and I want you to imagine now where you are in time. The king has created the earth. The beast has attempted over and over to take it. God has remained faithful and true. And now you're here in this moment. Life often feels like it's passing you by so quickly, but here you are. And now as you're sitting there, I want you to imagine that the king himself enters the room. Oh, so many people have missed the king. He's been standing right in front of them. He's been reaching out to them, giving them ways to partner with him. And now he's here with you. His presence is in this place. His goodness is made manifest to you. There's a few people in here or at any of the campuses or gatherings that you know you've not been serving that king. You know that the beast has taken too much ground in your life and it needs to end today. For some of you, it'll be surrendering your life, giving it to the king and saying, I'll follow you and your rules and your rules only. I'll serve you, king, for whatever purpose you have for me. For some of you, it'll be that the beast has been tempting you to think that God doesn't love you because of whatever bad thing has happened to you, that God doesn't care for you. 
that he's not there for you. This is the oldest lie and it is being revealed to you today so that you will not believe it anymore. So in just a moment, we're gonna take a moment to pray. There will be people at the front of every campus that you can pray with. I'm begging you. Get with someone today and pray. And say, I need to let the king into new areas of my life. So Lord, we do just that now corporately. We give you our lives. We give you our hands. We give you our feet. We give you the words we say and the things that we do. And Lord, may this be the generation that follows you, that rises up and conquers the beast once and for all. We pray all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Will you please stand? What an amazing message from Pastor Josh. And as the prayer team comes, maybe you felt stirred in your heart by what God was wanting to maybe partner with you on or maybe what God was saying into your own heart. So if you want to just come down, we'll be here as long as it takes at the altar to receive your prayers and pray with you. So we've got prayer teams up in the balcony as well at the exit. So please come down as I'm speaking. Uh, if you're online, you can text CONNECT to 71010. We have a team ready to pray with you as well. So just text CONNECT to 71010. But keep coming down as I give a few announcements. Tonight we have our Spanish night of worship at our Plano campus. You guys, if you've not been to a Spanish night of worship, it is on fire. And you don't need to speak Spanish to go. It is completely and totally a great time. I've been to a few, and so I recommend that you go to that tonight. It's super fun. Uh, we've got also our GLS Global Leadership Summit happening this next week. So if you are here, want to bring your teams, your family, your friends to that, it's a great time to grow as a leader, whether you want to lead your family well or your friends well or your business well, whatever it might be, come be a part of that. And lastly, we have baptisms, as I mentioned before, out in the, we have a party out front. So we, I, said, uh, I said we have lollipops. We have popsicles, not lollipops. I'm so sorry if I disappoint you. We have popsicles. So for any kids in the room, I'm so sorry, popsicles. And we've got our men's team out grilling as well. So come be a part of that. And again, if you wanna get baptized, we have everything you need to change clothes into, and we've got a changing room, all that stuff as well for you guys there. So let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in our hearts. I thank you, God, that you are the greater than he in this relationship and that we can turn to you and that you have everything we need. I thank you, God, that you are our king and that you invite us to partner with you. Bless those, God, that are here today as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, guys. Thank you for being here. Come down for prayer. See you next time.